When patients present to the dental office with an edentulous posterior maxilla, very likely the use of regular sized implants is not possible because of the proximity with the maxillary sinus. To overcome this challenge, many techniques are available like sinus lifting, for example, on one side, and on the other side, less invasive options like the use of short implants combined with tilted implants in the tuberosity, both with high success rates. And to talk about this really interesting topic, I've invited Professor Gabor Tepper from Austria, who has many cases with impressive more than 15 years follow-up using the technique he calls the no sinus lift concept. Join us in this conversation. I'm Dr. Christian Jerry, and you're watching Strauman Open Mic. Professor Tepper, welcome to Strauman Open Mic. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Christian. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So I will start kicking the door open. We know that patients don't come to our office with their mouth in a box so we can treat and they come later to pick it up. We don't treat a sight or a tooth or, or, or a gap. We treat human beings, we treat people. Absolutely. And information and communication has never been this abundant as of now. So patients, they do research everything they, before they choose a treatment. On this note, the patient experience has become equally as important as the outcome of the treatment itself. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. It's about the patient journey, to be very honest. Patients um, know what to expect from a treatment, as you have mentioned. Information is abundant. We do not have a lack of information. We have too much information. Yeah. We have uh, lots of false information, too, to be very honest with that. Um, there are many opinions which are not substantiated by facts. So our job is to deliver evidence-based therapy. But on the other hand, also to challenge things we've been doing for many years just because we've been doing them. So the patient journey is in the center and the focus of our attention. Make it easier, make it faster and make it more pleasant for the patient. That's what it's about today. And in regards to posterior maxillary region, Sinus lifting is still a valid option, isn't it? Sinus lifting is absolutely the valid option today. Sinus lifting has been extensively published and researched, and uh, it's been introduced in the late 70s, actually. Millions of sinus lifts have been performed, and it's been done on a daily basis in, in, in tens of thousands of, of dental practices and, and clinics in, on the whole planet. But still, sinus lifting, though it's so well substantiated and supported by data by research uh, poses significant risks to the patient. And what does the evidence say about this? The evidence says that unbelievably like up to one out of three sinus lifts are associated with a certain level of complications and the complications have a far range from long discomfort from non uh, you know osseo integration later on because the bone doesn't get good uh, inflammations prolonged pain uh, sinus complications which are affecting the patient for the rest of his life. So I think that we are very much responsible to reduce the risk to the max and still perform sinus lifts, but ask us in every, each and every single situation, do I have to sinus lift for this patient? Mm -hmm. Or can I afford it with all the technologies and all the biomaterials and new implants which we have today available? As we've said earlier, patients are very well informed and you have built a very interesting and successful reputation in Vienna exactly because patients look for alternative which in other proposals they could not find it. How, how do you explain this? People are well informed about the treatment options but people are also afraid. I mean the internet you know it offers videos and pictures of everything and you always see the worst outcome. It's either uh, <laughs> overwhelming marketing, everything is perfect, or everything is super complicated and goes wrong. So people are afraid and I think that people are entitled to a second thought. So I became a second opinion, a third opinion <laughs> for patients and what I encounter on a daily basis is patients coming in and, uh, and just asking me one question. I need a bone graft, as some dentists said, 
and I am afraid of that and I think I'm not going there. Um, can you give me an alternative which is less traumatic where I do not have an, you know, uh, but I do not have a, somebody treating my sinus, somebody putting a foreign material into my sinus. Because I remember when I was a child, when I was young, I had sinus infections. So people are reluctant to undergo that. And then we assess the bone, we go into a very precise 3D estimation of what we have with the 3D tomogram, with comb beam CTs, and with the implants we have today, like narrow implants, short implants, and the possibility to place them tilted, we can circumvent that. And in all those cases where I can responsibly spare the patient that invasive surgery, I go for it. And I see that success is supporting us. Those cases we look back on uh, 20 plus years of avoiding the sinus <laughs> lift, though we do sinus lifts a lot, not as many as we did like years ago, <laughs> but still, it works, and that's what, by the, you know, m word of, of of mouth, by propaganda from one patient to the next, which is the best marketing you have, the best recommendation you can get, is from a very satisfied and happy patient, and that's what supports your your concept. So you have matured the concept over the years, and have also you benefit from the current state of the art that the biotechnology is available Definitely. everywhere. So, but. It's not something you started yesterday, correct? So when did you start doing the sinus lifting concept, uh, the no sinus the lifting, no sinus lifting concept? <laughs> and, um, and why, actually? We have, to, we have to start everything with a why. Why? I've been doing sinus lifts on a daily basis at the University Dental Clinic. And uh, we've been treating complications a lot on a daily basis, mm -hmm. not um, inflicted by us. But you know, there is, some, there is a thing which is uh, quite an important thing I have to point out, the responsibility of teaching. Mm -hmm. Today you can, you can make a sinus lift course and they promise to the not so experienced dentist that uh, it's a Friday afternoon and maybe a Sunday morning and then you can do sinus lifts. And you're ready. And which is not correct and we have to act responsibly. And uh, I think that if you are sinus lifting, fine, go for it, but do it regularly so that your expertise grows and that you deliver a quality which is the quality your patients deserve. So I was starting asking myself over 20 years ago, which sinus lifts do we have really to perform? Those we do state of the art with the best materials and under super hygienic conditions, under surgical room environments. But if I can spare a patient a sinus lift, that became a success story. And uh, that's over 20 years ago. So as you asking me, what made me start it was the appearance of a new generation of implants 20 years ago, which were compression screws, which were root-shaped implants. Those gave us the chance, the opportunity, to significantly go up with primary stability and opened our eyes for new options. And the evolution of those implants, which started with the very simple screws, you know, root-shaped screws, and today are leading into high-tech devices like the BLX, like implants of the type, which are precision instruments in the bone to manage the bone quality, to, you know, to transport parts of the bone alongside your, your drill site, how they enable you to manage the quality of the bone. That's what gave us the tools we needed to expand the technology and the concept. So, and ever since you've been calling it the no sinus lift concept, which is of course not about only an implant or a connection, but it, you have guidelines to follow. Some elements must be in place. What are the elements that we should pay attention to if we want to engage this protocol? Yeah, the elements are very clear. First of all, you have to know where you are. If you tell your architect, please <laughs> build a house for me, he says, give me the plan. I want to see what's your, you know, your piece of land like? Is it flat? What's the, the soil made of? Is it stone? Is it soft? Is it gravel? What is it? So first we need to assess what we have. And there is no two cases alike, but there are similar cases. There is no two sinuses or subsinus alveolar crests alike, but there are, again, 
similar cases and similar situations. So since uh, 3D diagnostics is widely available for normal dental practices, uh, in the year of 2008, which is now over 13 years ago, uh, I was one of the first to acquire one of those comb beam tomographs for my practice. And that opened my eyes for anatomy. And I was teaching anatomy for 16 years at the Institute of Anatomy and Dissecting. So I think that what we have to learn to, and to adopt and to teach to the current and the next generation of dentists is visualize the anatomy, first 3D. And then you know what you will encounter during the surgery. So now you know where you are, and then you need the right tools. And I have to disappoint everybody who thinks that with the cheapest implant from the internet, you will have Formula One results. You will not, <laughs> Def definitely not. For, for a perfect result, you need the best materials available. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to, to advertise anything, but I'm advertising a protocol, and I'm advertising the super quality products. Whatever you go for, whatever the personal choice of the dentist is, and whatever works well in your hands will be the best implant. But in the end of the day, you are alone, alone with your responsibility. Did I choose the right products, the best quality for my patients? And by this, will I make sure the success rate of, of my concept? And then the next thing is after the choice, after the anatomy and the choice of the products, the handling. And the handling is something you have to train on a daily basis. It's the quality of the bone which you have to feel and to assess. And then it's the way you place the implant. It's the way to, to drill, to underprepare, to drill long enough, but to reduce the width of the drill protocol. It's the placement of the implant to achieve a certain primary stability. Uh, I was thinking about an experiment which I carried through a few years ago when I gave a hands-on in the United States. Uh, and uh, we gave the same piece of artificial bone block to 10 different dentists and told them, place the implant. And we were measuring the primary stabilities. So I can tell you it's 10 dentists, it's 20 hands, and it's 10 different primary stabilities, the same implant in the same bone. So it is up to our handling, and it's a job you perform with your hands. So you've got to know what you're doing. You just mentioned that sinus lifting imposes certain challenges, and the learning curve must be respected. The no sinus lifting it's not something that you can just start doing. There are some challenges related. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? First of all, we have to know who the patient is. Is it a young patient with very hard bone, super bone quality? Is it an older patient where the quality of the bone is decreasing? It's not only the quantity of the bone, which is a big factor, like which overall implant dimensions, implants surface, which would be the best thing to mention here, can I get into the bone? It's the length, it's the diameter, it's the overall surface of all the implants you can use and you can place. Then again, a bone in the menopause, a young bone, an older bone, is to be handled completely differently. Those implants are engaging the bone, they give you a superb primary stability, and then if you allow them to heal, you will get amazing results. I think that the combined implant length is a factor. So if you have a long and narrow implant and you have a short, maybe six millimeter implant or those four millimeter implants coming up and I'm really very hopeful and waiting for them. And then you have a long angulated implant, a thin tilted implant in the, in the tuberosity, which is uh, not in the sphenoid, not in the pterygoid, it's in the tuberosity. Then combined, the length is if you add it, two to three centimeters, which is long, and don't forget that these two centimeters or three are in original vital bone which is alive. And I am challenging every sinus lift on the planet <laughs> that after three months, the viability and the vitality of the bone will never be able to match and to integrate on the implant as an original bone which you have, even if there is less bone quantity-wise. So first of all, make sure you know where you are Make sure you know who the patient is in terms of biology, what to expect in terms of healing times, primary stability, overall implant length, and then go for it. Got it. Patient is at the center of everything we do. So how does the alternative to sinus lifting really benefit the patient? It benefits the patient in multiple ways. First of all, it's the trauma. It's the not 
invasively entering the maxillary sinus. The sinus wants to be left alone. Once you touch the sinus, it will be never be the way it was before. Um, enabling me with the concept of not putting artificial material into the sinus is a huge plus. That's number one. Number two is the post-operative recovery. Uh, without sinus lift, patients after, I would say, two to four, two to five days, completely forget that they had surgery, and even those days are very mild, if at all, in terms of discomfort. Then the healing time is a fraction, because healing is normal disintegration in local bone, which after two months, two and a half months is completed and we restore, compared to extracting, waiting, sinus lifting, waiting, implanting, then waiting for the long integration in the grafted bone, I would say it's like 10 to 20% of the treatment time if we can avoid grafting. So then again, the chair side time, patients have much less visits. The costs, there is no sinus lift, there is no artificial material, there are much less visits. The costs are reduced to just regular implant placement, no grafting, no grafting procedures, no material, no time for that and then prosthetic restoring. So the costs are also significantly reduced. And uh, last but not least, <laughs> these patients are surprised, almost shocked by, I thought it's a big surgery. I thought it's gonna be so painful. I thought I have to come so many times. I was afraid of the bone and I, I was worried actually for nothing. And that positive momentum we get is what is gonna be spread. So a happy patient <laughs> is gonna refer new patients. And uh, this is a win, 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 win. It's a, first of all, it's a win for the patient. It's a win for the, for the professional, for the dentist, for the practice, economic-wise and reputation-wise. And then it's a win for the industry because if we are more successful, then you as the industry <laughs> are more successful too. So I think this goes hand in hand. Well, especially in regards to the patient, it's really, really, really hard to argue against what you just put on a table. Professor Tepper, it's always a pleasure. I really appreciate your honest and transparent way how you approach every topic and the same as this important topic that is the no sinus lift concept. Thank you very much for joining us on Strauman Open Mic. Thank you so much for the invitation, dear Christian. Always good to work with you. Thank you. Pleasure. So if you're interested how to really approach your posterior maxillary cases with the no sinus lift concept, don't miss the upcoming webinar with Professor Tepper in March 30th at Strauman Campus Live. It's a great opportunity. I would not miss that. Thanks for watching and I see you in the next episode of Strauman Open Mic.